Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. We've made a downloadable transcript of this tutorial available as a free study tool. Just click the link below in the video details to get this. Hello and welcome to this Introduction to Confluence course. My name is Dan Lefebvre and I've consulted and developed processes, standards and workflows for organizations around the world that are using Confluence to help them be more productive. Today, we're going to uncover the key features that you need to know to master Confluence's powerful capabilities. We'll start by learning some of the terms and concepts that we'll find inside of Confluence. From there, we'll get familiar with personal spaces before hopping into team spaces. And of course, we'll learn exactly what Confluence means when it's using the term spaces. Then we'll learn how to manage spaces before covering Confluence's administrative backend to see how that works. Now we've got a ton to cover throughout this course, so let's kick things off in our next video by getting familiar with some of the different licenses and versions of Confluence that are available. As we're learning about Confluence today, it's possible the version I'm using on my end may look a little different than the one you are using. So in this video, we'll learn a bit about why that might be the case. Now, like any software, it's going to change over time as new versions are released. So depending on which version your organization is using, that can change how it looks. Fortunately, the core concepts that we'll be covering throughout this course have been around since pretty much the beginning of Confluence. So I'm confident that they'll be applicable to you. There just might be some slight differences here and there in some of the features or where they're located, depending on which version you have. Now, the biggest driver behind which version of Confluence you have is most likely going to be the license of Confluence that you have. That's because depending on which license your organization has, that's going to affect how quickly the version of Confluence gets updated. Now, there are three key licenses of Confluence, and we can kind of group these three licenses into two groups. There's Confluence Cloud and then Confluence Server and Confluence Data Center are in their own group. And right away, there's one very important thing to point out. Confluence Server is going away. As of this recording, Atlassian is currently going through the end of life process for Confluence Server. However, you still might be using Confluence Server at your organization. As we can see from this screenshot from Atlassian's site, Confluence Server will still be around and supported into 2024. That's why I wanted to point this out. Now, the common denominator between server and data center, and the reason why I would kind of group those together is because they're both going to be installed at your organization. Like the names imply, they're gonna be installed, maintained, and managed at your company's server or data center. There are a few differences between Confluence Server and Confluence Data Center. And we can see some of those on Atlassian's website. Really, some of these differences between server on the left-hand side and data center on the right-hand side, some of these differences have to do with the fact that server is going away. So as new features are rolled out, they're not going to roll them out into uh, software that's going to be given its end of life in Confluence Server. It's going to roll into data center. Most of these differences are more advanced and outside the scope of this course, but I wanted to point them out so you're aware they exist and you can dig into them more if you'd like to. And that brings us to Confluence Cloud. Confluence Cloud is the software as a service or SaaS version of Confluence. Basically, instead of installing Confluence on your organization's local servers with the Confluence Cloud, you're gonna be paying a monthly subscription fee so Atlassian can handle all of that for you. As you can imagine, there's going to be pros and cons for each of these. Probably the biggest benefit to Confluence Cloud is just what I mentioned. You don't have to worry about installing or maintaining Confluence to make sure it's up and running and accessible by everyone on your team. And if there is a new version of Confluence that gets released, Atlassian is automatically going to roll out those updates and make sure that no data gets lost as new versions are installed. 
and really what that means as far as Confluence Cloud is that the version doesn't really matter as much because it's automatically going to be updated. And today we're going to be using Confluence Cloud. That means the version of Confluence I'm using today is the latest version as of this recording, which is 7.3. But that also means that if you're using Confluence Server or Confluence Data Center and your organization hasn't updated it recently, that's why you might see some slight differences, including interface changes or features that Atlassian has added since your version has been updated. Or on the other side, if there are new versions that get released after I'm recording this and Atlassian updates Confluence Cloud, then that can also make things look different. Now, the last thing I wanted to point out is that it is possible to use the Atlassian Marketplace to extend the capabilities of Confluence using third-party apps. But for this course, I'm not going to be using any apps, add-ons, or plugins. A Confluence subscription is all we'll be using. And I specifically designed this course to avoid using any apps or add-ons because I wanted to focus solely on the capabilities of Confluence by itself. Okay. So now that we have a better idea of which version and license of Confluence we're using today, let's move on to our next section where we'll start to unpack some of the key terms and concepts that you need to know before we dive into Confluence. See you there. In this video, we'll take a minute to get a better understanding of exactly what Confluence is and what it's used for. So Confluence is a wiki application. <laughs> right away, that's going to beg the question, what is a wiki application? Well, in a nutshell, a wiki application sometimes is called wiki software or wiki engine. Different people call it different things. Basically, it's software that's specifically designed for collaborative editing using only a web browser. You don't have to install any special software in order to get this to work. And the name Wiki might bring to mind the world's most popular Wiki application, Wikipedia. Wikipedia may be the most popular, but that doesn't mean it is the only Wiki application out there. In fact, its name simply is combining an encyclopedia that's driven by a Wiki application. Of course, Confluence is not associated with Wikipedia other than having similar technology that allows users to edit collaboratively using only the web browser. Confluence is developed by a company called Atlassian, which is the same company behind the extremely popular agile project management and issue tracking tool, Jira. Even though Jira is outside the scope of this course, because Confluence and Jira are used side by side a lot, one of the most common questions that I get from new users to Confluence or really any of Atlassian's products is, what's the difference? And so in this case, what is the difference between Confluence and Jira? Well, let's move on to our next video where we'll look at some of those differences. In my experience, it's easy for users who are new to Confluence to confuse it with Atlassian's most popular product, Jira. So in this video, we'll take a quick look at how Confluence and Jira are different. The first thing to keep in mind is that Confluence and Jira are separate licenses. That means it's possible to have a license to Confluence without Jira. It's also possible to have a license to Jira without Confluence. So having one does not necessarily mean that you'll have the other. So it's possible for your organization to have Confluence and not have access to Jira. I like to think of Confluence as a digital brain for your organization, a place where things can be stored. Your entire team can store processes, workflows, documents, data, pretty much anything else that you can think of. And I'm not, when I, say, when I say a place to store things, I'm not necessarily talking about storing files like you know on your server, like a Google Drive or Dropbox or anything like that. It's not really designed for that, although you can have attachments. We'll look at that later on in this course, but more where information can be stored. And so of course that information is going to live in documents and images and, and, and things like that. And that can be live inside of Confluence. 
On the other hand, JIRA is for tracking projects that are currently in progress. So tracking issues, things like bugs and features for your website, for software, whatever that may be, and tracking projects and how uh, different projects and their, their status and where they are in, uh, in progress. So a use case example of this, let's say that we're building an app, right? So if we're building an app, then Jira is going to be where our team tracks that app's development, the current status of different elements, you know, the front end UI, the current status of that, the back end development, the status of that. Whereas Confluence can be where the standards and processes are stored. So more like, you know, this is the, the default way that we're going to do something. This is the naming convention that we're going to use on the back end as we're developing things. Or this is the brand logo that we're always going to use that can be stored in Confluence that then works really well with Jira. But there, they are different uses. And maybe an, another example would be tracking the version releases and the current status of that, say we're working, are working on version 2.0 of our app, right? The status of that can all be tracked inside of Jira. However, once that is released, what bugs have been fixed, what new features have been added, all of that stuff and the status of those as it's being worked on can be tracked in Jira. And then we can take that and we can use Confluence to write the change log for that to have that either be accessible publicly or on the back end, we can have that be accessible to only people on our team in our organization. Another great use case would be uh, having users, public users, being able to submit bugs Th that would go into JIRA because those are things that would need to be action items and be, and be acted on and turn into projects and things that would be fixed in maybe version 3.0 of our app, if that's where we're at. Uh, but then Inside of Confluence, that can be a great place to view knowledge-based documentation, right? So the documentation for our app, how it all works, and things like that can be public-facing inside of Confluence. Of course, those are just a few use cases, but hopefully you're starting to get an idea for how Confluence and Jira are separate, but they can work really, really well together, or they can work independently, depending on your organization's needs. Okay, so let's move on to our next video where we're going to cover some key terms that we'll come across inside of Confluence. Throughout this course, we'll be covering a lot of different features inside of Confluence. Before we dive into the interface, though, I want to take a couple minutes just to cover a few terms that we'll see in Confluence that can be a little more abstract or really just to get a better understanding of what Confluence means when it's using this term. So let's kick this off with pages. So pages are important to understand because they are where all of our content inside of Confluence will live. Things like our text, images, tables, attachments, macros, they all live on pages. Speaking of macros, <laughs> that's another one to talk about because macros inside of Confluence are ways to pull in dynamic content. For example, let's say you have a page with headers. You can add in a table of contents macro to automatically link to the headers to jump down the page faster. Or another example would be if you're using Jira. We talked in our last video about how Jira and Confluence can be used together. Let's say you're using Jira and Confluence, you can display issues from Jira directly on your Confluence pages using macros and those update automatically. If something gets updated in Jira, you're gonna see the latest information inside of Confluence when you're using macros. And that brings us to our next term, that's spaces. So spaces inside of Confluence are where the pages live. If, you're, if you are familiar with Jira, you can think of spaces as Confluence's alternative to projects. In Jira, you have issues that live inside of projects. And in Confluence, you have pages that live inside of spaces. Now, the spaces in Confluence are 
where we can control things like permissions. Who can see the pages that live inside of that space? We can control things like how the pages in that space are organized and things like that. We'll be looking at these features throughout this course in a lot more depth, but for now, let's hop into Confluence in our next video and get an overview of the interface. In this video, we'll start getting familiar with Confluence by looking at its interface. Now, when we first log into Confluence, by default, we'll be sent to our homepage, which we can see here. And in here, we'll find all our most recent spaces, any recent pages that we visited or worked on. And then on the right-hand side, we'll find Confluence announcements. So these are things that our Confluence administrator has set up, as well as a feed of all the most recent updates made by anyone in our organization for all the spaces that we have access to, not just the stuff that we've done. Well, right now you can see this is pretty empty in here. It's a fresh installation of Confluence. But as we continue throughout this course, we'll see this homepage start to fill up. Now, most of the navigation that we'll be doing is up on the top. And it is worth pointing out that all this navigation on the top here used to be along the left side of the interface. In 2020, Atlassian started rolling out a big interface update that moved all the navigation to the top. So if you still have navigation on the left side, that just means you're running an older version of Confluence. And how quickly you'll get updated to the latest version depends on your Confluence license like we talked about before. If you're using a cloud subscription, then you don't have to worry about that. Atlassian has already rolled out all of those updates to the latest version. Okay, so let's go from left to right to see what all this means. So this very first button here, this is the app switcher. This lets you switch between the Atlassian products that you have access to. So you can see in my case, I have a license to both Jira as well as Confluence. So in here, I can switch between my Confluence and Jira installations very, very easily. But again, as we learned licensing for Confluence and Jira, Though they are different. So just because you have Confluence doesn't necessarily mean you have Jira. And then, of course, we can come in and we can start to add in more Atlassian products if we wanted to. The key thing I want to point out there is that you have to be an overall Confluence administrator in order to add in new Atlassian products because that will incur a bill based on how many users you have. Next to the app switcher, we have the Confluence logo. Depending on how your Confluence installation is set up, this can be customized. It might be your company's logo, uh, but the action that it takes is the same. It's going to take you back home to your homepage. So no matter where you are working you know, throughout this course, if you get stuck, you can always come back, click on the logo in the top left, and get back to the homepage. Or you can also use a keyboard shortcut. So we can see this is also home, right? So we can see this is where we're at. If we hover over this, we can see the keyboard shortcut GD. And what that means is to tap G and then D sequentially, not at the same time, but sequentially. So that will take us back to our homepage here. The recent dropdown, we can see that is GR. We can see the keyboard shortcut. So I'll move my mouse away and I'm just gonna tap G and R and that will pull up the recent dropdown you can see there, right? So G and R, just gonna pull up the recent dropdown. And in the recent dropdown, we can see basically everything that we see here on the homepage, you can see down here, but it's up in the menu and using that keyboard shortcut can be a very fast way to get to recent pages that we visited, things that we've recently worked on and, and so on. Next to our recently worked on, we have spaces. So we've looked at the concept of spaces in an earlier video, and we're going to look at spaces in a lot more depth later on in this course. Just know that this is where you can come in to find all of your spaces. Uh, anything that you've worked on, any spaces that you've worked on recently will start to show up here as well. Very similar to this here on, on the homepage. So you can start to get a sense for how this menu is really just a faster way of accessing things that... Uh, you've worked on recently. So it's all about working faster and working and being more productive. Next, we have people. So in here, we can either search for people and find them uh, um, amongst our Confluence installation, 
Or we can come in and we can start to add people to our team, to our Confluence installation. Now, the thing I want to point out with this, very similar to adding in new Atlassian products, when we add people to our Confluence uh, installation, that will adjust the bill. As we learned, the license for Confluence Cloud is based on the users that have access. And so if you are a Confluence administrator, you can add users, and we'll look at adding users and user management later on in this course. But if you're not a Confluence administrator, when you invite somebody to Confluence, what that does is really it sends a notification to the Confluence administrator that they have to approve. Because again, that is going to adjust the billing for Confluence itself. Next to people, we have our apps. So there is a lot of functionality that we can add to Confluence through add-ons that you can purchase through the Atlassian Marketplace. Talked about this briefly in an earlier video. Uh, but for this course, we will not be using any add-ons. This course is specifically designed to not use any add-ons. It's only using Confluence. So you won't have to have access to a bunch of extra things outside of Confluence. Then we have templates. So we will be looking at templates uh, later on. They are a fast way to create a page with a pre-built layout. Uh, let's say we want to build documentation for our dev team. We can have that as a template for them so that it's laid out differently than maybe our marketing team's documentation, but we still have continuity between them. And again, we'll look at that later on in this course. And then we have create, and this will create a new page. We'll be using this a lot throughout this course. And if we hover over that, you can see the keyboard shortcut for that is C. Over here on the right side, we have search. So the keyboard shortcut for that is, a, is forward slash to jump to search. Uh, pretty straightforward. It lets you search across Confluence. The only thing to really point out here is that if you do not have access to something, then it's not going to show up in your search. If you if there's a page that's on a space that you do not have access to or the page has been restricted from you, then you it won't show up in your search. So that's just something to keep in mind there. And we have notifications. Notifications are pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll start seeing numbers pop up here when you have notifications, like when someone comments on a page that you're watching or when someone tags your username somewhere inside of Confluence. And we'll look at notifications and kind of how this works later on in this course as well. This is just a quick way to hop to wherever those notifications came from. Next, we have help. And this is pretty straightforward, but I do want to point it out. It accesses Atlassian's documentation for Confluence and it is some excellent documentation. So at any point throughout this course, if you get stuck, I would highly recommend taking advantage of Atlassian's amazing documentation. Next to that, we have our settings. Now, these settings are the overall Confluence administration settings. So if you don't see this, then that just means you don't have permissions to it. And of course, we will be looking at the administrative backend later on in this course as well. Next to that, we have our profile and our personal account settings. So things like if you want to change our uh, profile picture, our password, things like that, then we can do that in here. Okay, so that is a look at the user interface here in Confluence. And as we've seen throughout this video, as we choose things from the navigation up at the top, as we would expect, the primary work area of Confluence is going to change to be whatever we've picked. And we'll get familiar with all these different areas in Confluence. But for now, I would encourage you to take some time between videos, start clicking around in here to get accustomed to where things are at, how the interface changes, where things might be located in your organization's installation of Confluence. And don't worry, you can always get back to your Confluence homepage either by clicking on the logo up here, the home link, or as we learn, the keyboard shortcut is G N D, and that will take you back to the homepage. When you're ready, I will see you in the next section where we'll learn how to use personal spaces. One of the things we learned in our last section was the term spaces. So in this video, we'll take a few moments to dig deeper into the concept of spaces, as well as learning about the two types of spaces that we'll come across inside of Confluence, personal spaces and team spaces.
So overall, regardless of if we're talking about a personal space or a team space, they are a way of organizing all the things that we want to store. An analogy that I like to use for spaces is a filing cabinet. So if we think of Confluence as the overall filing cabinet, then we can think of each drawer in that filing cabinet as a space. And then inside the drawer, we can put, well, whatever sort of content we want, documents, images, standards, processes, and so on. And just like the drawer on the filing cabinet, we can lock that drawer if we want to, to determine who has access to it or who has access to the content inside. So one of the key things inside Confluence that is going to help us hold our content are the pages. And an analogy that I used in an earlier video was how Jira uses projects to hold issues and our data is stored inside of the issues. Well, in Confluence, it's the pages that hold our content and those pages live in the spaces. So if we were to use an example here, let's say we have a website documentation space. We could have a page that has an overview of the interface of our website. We could have another page that has all of our frequently asked questions. Of course, the content that lives on each of those pages can be very different. We could have images on the inter interface overview. We could have text on our FAQs, things like that. We could even have maybe a, a blog post that has recent updates all of that lives inside of the space. We could have a page that has Jira issues with the bugs on the website for our internal team to be able to see what sort of issues there are currently, what their current status is. We can pull those in using macros, which is another term we learned about in a previous video. Now, inside of Confluence, there are two types of spaces. There are team spaces and personal spaces. Confluence lets us create a personal space that each user has full control over. They can be a great way to keep track of tasks we need to get done. A common use that I've seen a lot of colleagues use personal spaces for almost as their own personal staging area for items that they're working on. They might build pages or content that they're working on before moving those pages into a team space for everyone to see. And there's not a single use for personal spaces. It's just a place for us to really use it however we need to without worrying about how all the other spaces across the organization are put together. On the other side of that, we have team spaces. And those are designed to be site-wide or global across our entire company's Confluence installation. And by that, I don't necessarily mean that everybody in the organization has to see a team space. You can still control who has access to it, but you can. it's kind of designed to be seen more than a team. And this is where some of the more abstract concept can be because you can also have multiple people seeing your personal space if you want to, to see the pages on there. You can also have a team space if you really wanted to, to lock it down to only a few people that can see that. But behind the scenes, what Confluence is trying to do is give the ability for anybody in the organization to create their own space, to have a place where they can create content inside of Confluence, and they can have administrative control over that, even if they don't have administrative control over anything else inside of Confluence. Whereas with team spaces, they're designed and they need to be created by an administrator overall. So the primary difference here is really the intent, right? So the intent behind it, team spaces are intended to be used by our whole organization or by teams in our organization working together, whereas personal spaces are really intended to be used individually. So as we're going through these inside of Confluence, just keep that in mind because that's what Confluence is trying to use these different uh, types of spaces for. Team spaces intended to be used by the whole organization. Personal spaces really intended to be used individually. But with that said, both of them can contain the same type of content. They both contain pages, and those pages can contain images and text and whatever sort of information you want to control or contain, rather, on that page or in that uh, space. All right, so to recap, Spaces are a way of organizing content by using pages in Confluence. 
Now that we're a little more familiar with the concept of spaces, digging a little bit deeper into those, let's hop back into Confluence where we'll see what one of those looks like, what a space looks like as we create our own personal space. And we'll do that in the next video. In this video, we'll learn how we can create a space. Now, as we learned in our last video, there are two types of spaces. We'll be creating and working with a personal space in this section because it's the type of space that doesn't require any special administrative permissions. If you wanna learn how to create a team space, we'll be looking at that later on in this course. Okay, so let's create our personal space. To do that, it's super simple. All we have to do is to come up to the top right-hand side and come to add personal space. Once we do that, we can give this a name. So by default, it's gonna be our name. I'm just gonna keep it at that. Hit create, and <laughs> that's all there is to it. I told you it was super easy. Now we'll be looking at how we can start creating content for our new space here in a bit. But before we do that, I wanna point out how we can find this space again. So if you were to go to our home page, come up to home, to get back to this space, all we have to do is come over to the top right-hand side and find our personal space here. Okay, so in this video, we learned how to create our own personal space in Confluence. Now let's move on to our next video where we'll learn how to navigate our personal space. In our last video, we learned how to create our personal space. In this video, we'll take a few minutes to get familiar with how to navigate our personal space. So let's hop over to our spaces we learned. We can get there from our profile, come into personal space. And over here on the left-hand side is where we're gonna do a lot of our navigation for the space. And the first thing I wanna point out is we can actually expand or collapse this if we want to. You can see this little uh, icon here, as well as the keyboard shortcut of the left or open bracket. So we can collapse or expand it. We can also resize it however we want. So I'm gonna keep this, give this a little bit of space so we can see this as we're going through. The first option here is overview. And technically the overview for our personal space, it's just a page. It's not different than any other page that we might create, except it's the home page or the default page that gets shown when we browse to our personal space as we just saw. We can customize this page however we want using the techniques that we're gonna learn throughout this course. I just wanna point that out that this is really just another page. Underneath the overview, we have blog. Now a blog in Confluence is a, spe it's a page, it's a special type of page that is tied to the date that we create it. Then we have our space settings. So anytime we have administrative permissions for a space, then we're gonna see the space settings option in our menu. Now that doesn't mean that we have overall administrative permissions for all of the spaces in our Confluence installation, but this is our personal space. So we have administrative permissions for it. When we see the space settings, that means that we have administrative permissions. Underneath these space settings, we can add a shortcut. So this is pretty simple and straightforward. We could say uh, maybe add in a website that we might go to a lot, something like that. Add the shortcut. And then you can see how that gets added here. Uh, for example, maybe link to our organization's internal email. I've seen that used a lot, or maybe a project that we're working on that is external outside of Confluence. Uh, really anything that we want, we can add in those shortcuts there. Beneath the shortcuts, we have the pages that live in our space. Now, as you can see, when we created our personal space, Confluence automatically created a few sample pages. So we can see, some of these sample pages that have been created, right? So if we actually go look at one of these, we can see how these pages are laid out very differently. These are actually using different templates. And again, we'll be looking at templates later on, but we can see how even though they're all pages, they look very different and they contain very different information. 
Okay, so that is a look at our personal space, and I'd encourage you to take some time between videos to create your own personal space if you haven't done so yet, and click around to get familiar with how it's laid out. It's a great way, almost as a sandbox, if nothing else, to create pages or create things or get familiar with navigating and moving around inside of Confluence. When you're ready, I'll see you in our next video where we'll look at creating pages in our personal space. In this video, we'll create our first custom page in our personal space. Fortunately, since creating pages is something we'll be doing a lot of inside of Confluence, the process is very easy to do. All we need to do is to come up to the Create button, or we can use the keyboard shortcut C, as in Create, in order to create our new page. Click on that, and that's going to take us to Confluence's Page Editor. Now, the basic concept of this is going to be pretty straightforward. If you're familiar with something like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, let's give this page a title. So let's say this is my first Confluence page. And then in the body, we can add any sort of text that we want. So maybe something like, welcome to my personal space on Confluence. Now, you'll notice as soon as I started typing there, this right-hand side completely disappeared. So let's undo that to see, get, dig into that a little bit more. I'm going to hit Control-Z, uh, Command-Z, if you're on a Mac, in order to undo. And that's going to bring this sidebar back. So what this sidebar is, is asking us if we want to use a template for this page. So there's a lot of different templates we can do. We can hover over this to see a preview of these different templates. And I'd encourage you to go through a lot of these. These are all pre-built inside of Confluence. Of course, we'll look at creating our own custom templates later on in this course. Um, but these are all pre-built that are ready to use. So there's a lot of templates. You, know, you can scroll down and see just how many there are that come pre-installed with Confluence, which is really cool. There's just so many of them. Let's say, actually, let's use this one. Let's use our to-do list. So watch what happens over on the left side of the page editor. So we can see when I choose this template, all of a sudden, then it's going to pre-populate a lot of that information, making it really, really fast to just come in and fill in the details, which is exactly what we would expect from a template. So maybe we want to change this from my first Confluence page to my to-do list, right? But you'll notice I had to scroll all the way down to this to-do list template. Now, if I'm using this template a lot, that can get tedious. Of course, we can always come in and we could filter if we wanted to. So you can come in here and you can filter by the templates, but there's another way that we can speed up our workflow here. So let's go ahead and let's publish this page. So that gets saved. We can see it's over here on the left side menu. And if we come into our space settings and then come into the templates here, we can come in and promote a template to the top of that list. So let's find our to-do list in here. So there we go. There's the to-do list. And let's promote that. So now that is promoted to the very top. And of course, we could disable or enable these if we wanted to. But actually, before we do that, let's look and see what this one change did before we start making a bunch of other changes. So if I come back to create a new page, over here on the right-hand side, we can see now we have this little filter here for the promoted ones that we can very easily filter out everything else, right? So that's one way that we can simplify this. There is another way. If we come in, I'm going to close this out. I'm not going to publish that. Let's come into our space settings, come back to our templates. And if we start to disable a lot of these, then they're not even going to show up in that list, right? So I'm going to pause the video real quick while I go through and disable all these. Okay, so I've gone through and I've disabled all of the templates with the exception of the to-do list template. 
here, right? So watch what happens now when I come in and create a page. Over here on the right-hand side, all of a sudden, that's been cleared up. We don't have nearly as many templates in here. It makes it a lot easier to find what we use the most. So I would highly recommend, whether it's uh, your personal space or if you're not seeing all the templates in a team space, then that's something that maybe your Confluence administrator has done. Or for your personal space, go in there and clear out the templates that you're not going to use. It'll save you time having to scroll up and down. That's just a little uh, tip that I've learned over the years using Confluence. Okay, so in this video, we learned how to create a new page. We also learned how to promote templates or disable them from our space to clean up the list just a little bit. We also learned how to use a template. We used that to-do list template and published our page. Okay, now in our next video, we'll learn how we can control who sees our personal space in Confluence. In this video, we'll learn how we can control who has access to our personal space. While it doesn't hurt anything to let our organization see our personal space, one of the most common requests I have from team members is how to make their personal space, well, more personal. <laughs> by that, what I mean is the ability to make sure no one else has access to it, because by default, Anyone that has access to your organization's Confluence installation has access to view your personal space. And if you're using it as a place for drafts or you're just you know, using it there, maybe you don't want everybody to be able to see it. So we can change this if we want to. All we need to do is to come into our space settings, come into the space permissions. And I realize this can be very confusing at first glance, but let's break this down to see what we're looking at here. So at the very top, we have groups. Confluence administrators can set up groups in your Confluence installation to make it easier to allow access to spaces by controlling them here. For example, maybe there's a group for the entire marketing team, so they don't have to manually add each user to each space every single time. As an end user, generally, we don't really have to worry about this, but if you are an administrator, then we'll look at how the back end of all that works later on in the administrative section of this course. Underneath groups, we have individual users. Sometimes it's easier to give access to individual users instead of entire groups, and this is where we can do that. Or, of course, we can enable anonymous access. Anonymous access means that anyone on the internet will be able to see the space without being logged in. This is how organizations can make their documentation public. But I would highly recommend leaving this off unless there is a very specific reason to turn it on. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of a better idea of what we're looking at here, how can we disable access to our personal space for other people in our organization? Well, we can come in here to our groups. So some of these groups are pre-built with Confluence, right? And that's these here, the Confluence admins, which is going to be the overall administrators inside of Confluence, as well as the users, which are any users inside of our Confluence installation, not necessarily the administrators, right? So let's come in and uncheck this to be able to view things. So once we do that, make sure we save, <laughs> save here at the bottom. Once that's saved, let's hop. So I have another browser window open here where I'm logged in as another user. And right now we can see if we come into view all spaces, we can see that we can't find Dan's personal space. It's not visible here, right? But if we were to hop back into the permissions and for the Confluence users, let's add this back so we can see how that changes. Right, so now that this is enabled with you, again, make sure to save. This is a common thing. A lot of times you'll be like, well, I changed it, um, but 
forgot to hit save. And I've, I've done this before too. You forget to hit save on things. That's fine. So now that we can view, if we hop back, logged in as a different user. Now, if we refresh now, okay, we can view Dan's personal space and all of the pages inside of it. Okay. So to recap, in this video, we learned how we can control the permissions of our personal space to control who has access to it. In this case, we disabled the ability for any users to be able to see it, right? If we wanted to make sure that only specific users can see it, then we could use the individual users. And that's kind of how the permissions work. You'll notice that even though I edited the permissions for all the users, if you think about it, uh, me, Dan LeFebvre, as the user, also needs permission to be able to see this. But even though I, what, I disabled the ability for all Confluence users to see it, I still have permissions here as an individual user, right? So depending on how these permissions are set up, if you give an individual user permission, that will override whether or not they're in a group or not. Okay, great. Now let's move on to our next video where we'll look at how we can delete our personal space. Earlier in this section, we learned how to create our personal space. And in this video, we'll learn how we can delete our personal space. Okay, so deleting our personal space is actually really easy to do. All we have to do is to come into our space settings and then under manage space, go to delete space. I do want to point out, once you delete the space, there's no way to bring any of that information back once it's deleted. Of course, we can bring the space back but we can't actually bring back that information. So any of the pages that we've created and that data on there is going to be lost, okay? So if we wanna go through this process, delete, we can see that Confluence is gonna warn us, are you sure? Are you sure you actually wanna delete this? There's no recycle bin, there's no trash, no way to bring it back. The If you're not 100% sure, you can archive it. We'll look at archiving later on in this course, uh, but that's an alternative to deleting that doesn't actually get rid of it, but just hides the space. If you're sure that you want to delete this space, just click on delete space, go through that, and then Confluent is gonna go through the process of deleting that space. And there we go. It's gone. <laughs> of course, we just created this space, so it's not like I'm losing a lot of information by deleting it here. But again, it's worth pointing out that there is no recycle bin, there's no trash. When you delete our personal space, it is completely gone. However, we can always recreate our personal space again. So we can come up here, go up here, add personal space. I went to the home to kind of refresh the page to let Confluence know that you know we had deleted that. And you'll notice that now it says add personal space. So we can walk through that exact same process that we want uh, did earlier in this section to create that space. But you'll notice we have our sample pages. We don't have that to-do list page that we had created. The custom data that we had added is completely gone. And as you can probably guess from going through the process of creating and deleting our personal space in this section, at any given time, each user can only have one personal space in Confluence. If we want more spaces, that's really where team spaces come into play. And we'll look at team spaces starting in our next section. See you there. In our last section, we looked at creating and navigating our personal space, each in their own individual videos. Now, if you followed along with those, then what we're going to do in this video might seem familiar to you and for good reason. That's because the process is very similar with team spaces. That just means we can work a little faster in this video as we kick off this section by looking at creating and navigating a team space. So right away, one big difference in creating a team space compared to creating a personal space has to do with permissions. In order to create a team space, we have to have overall administrative permissions inside of Confluence. 
That's different than a personal space where we don't have to have overall administrative permissions. But if we do, the process for creating a new space is pretty simple. All we need to do is either on our homepage, we can click on the create a space button up here at the top, or in the spaces drop down, we can come to create a space. Now, when we do that, we'll see that even the spaces have some templates. So these are pre-built into Confluence. I haven't added them in with any sort of add-ons or anything like that. These are pre-built into Confluence. Really, they just come with a few pages already in place. Personally, I like to start with a blank space so that way I can organize things in my own way. But these are there if you want to try them out. So let's start with a blank space. I'm gonna hit next to give it a name. So let's say maybe this is our website documentation. The space key needs to be unique. You can't have two spaces that share the same key. That's because it's used in the URLs for this space. So that's something to keep in mind. Let's give this maybe web as the key. And then I'm just gonna leave this at the default permissions, which is something we looked at editing in a previous video for our personal space. Uh, this is just for the team space. All right, let's go ahead and click on create. And there we go. Okay, now that we've created our team space, let's get a quick overview of our new space. So just like we saw with our personal space, by default, we're gonna go to this overview page. That is the home page for our team space. It's the default landing page when we navigate to our team space. And we'll look at how to customize that later on in this section. Beneath that, we have our blog. So blog is just a special type of page that's tied to the date that we create it. So if we were to create this, we can see it's just like any other page. Maybe let's say this is my team's first blog post. Give it something there. As soon as we publish this, then we can see how it's tied to the date that it's created. Right, So just something a little bit different in the way that Confluence handles the blog posts. But generally speaking, it's very similar to pages in the way that it works. Beneath that, we have our space settings. So anytime we have administrative permissions for a space, we'll see the space settings option in our menu. That doesn't mean that we have administrations to Confluence overall. Like I mentioned, the overall Confluence administ uh, administrative permissions, we need to create a space. But in order to edit the space, all we need to have is administrative permissions for this one single space. Of course, if you have overall administrative permissions, then you will also have administrative permissions for the space as well. And beneath the space settings, we have space shortcuts. So we can add any sort of shortcut that we want to our menu here, just be a fast way to access things very quickly. Uh, so let's say we wanted to add in a URL that we go to a lot. Something like this. Add the shortcut. And then once we save that, we can see that is listed in our menu here, just a fast way to access things. Beneath the shortcuts, we have the pages that are in our space. And we'll create a page here in a second, but before we do that, I do wanna point out here at the bottom, we have archived pages. These are basically pages that are hidden from our primary navigation. Uh, rather than deleting them, we have the option to archive a page that will essentially hide it, but not actually delete it. Because once you delete it, there's no bringing it back. It can't be, there's no trash or recycle bin or anything like that to bring that page back. Okay, now before we wrap up this video, let's walk through that same process that we did, creating a page in our personal space, but see how that works very similarly in a team space. So to create a new page, all we need to do is to come up to the Create button. And since we're already in this space, by default, Confluence will know that this is where that page will live. So maybe let's give this a name. And put something in the bottle body of the text. Yep, this is our team space. There we go. We can see the process is very similar. And 
If you'll notice when I was editing this, as soon as I started editing, that right side disappeared. So just like we did with the personal space, if I hit Control Z or Command Z on a Mac to undo this, we can bring this back and we can see that we also have templates that we can pull from here. So as you can see, there's a ton of templates already he here pre-built into Confluence. So let's maybe, let's use maybe this uh, weekly meeting notes. As soon as I click on this, you can see all of a sudden our page adjusts to that template and it really just pre-populates with a lot of things. It makes it faster to come in and fill in those details exactly like what we would expect from a template, right? But you'll notice there's a ton of them in here. And just like we did with the personal space, we can come in here and trim this list down. Let me publish this real quick and then come into our space settings, come over to templates. And in here, we can disable any of these templates we don't want to see in that view. So a fast way to get to these, I'm going to hit Control F or Command F to, to browse. So let's say we're looking for our weekly meeting notes, right? So this is the one we want to make sure stays enabled. I'm going to pause the video real quick and just go through and disable all of these so we can see what that looks like. So I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so I've gone through and disabled all of the templates except for this weekly meeting notes. So now if I come in and create a page, over here on the right-hand side, we can see the only thing that's left is that template. And then blog posts, as I mentioned, is kind of a special, unique uh, type of page inside of Confluence. So it's not really a template uh, per se, so that's still there. But all the templates are gone except for the one that we still have enabled. Okay, so to recap, as we saw throughout this video, the process of creating a team space, navigating that team space, as well as creating pages in a team space. Overall, those are all very similar to what we saw in a personal space. And that brings up a great point because a lot of the things that we'll be covering in this section can also be done in our personal space as well. So even if we didn't cover something in our previous section, there's a good chance it's something that we can do in a personal space as well. For example, when it comes to page drafts and unpublished versions, those exist in personal spaces too. To save you time, we won't be going through every single feature multiple times, but I did want to give an example in this video of how similar team and personal spaces can be. And speaking of drafts and versions, we'll be looking at those here in our team space in the next video. See you there. In this video, we'll learn about page drafts and unpublished versions. Now, by default, when we create a new page, it's a draft up until the moment that we publish it. So let's see this in action. I'm gonna create a new page. We can either go to the Create button at the top or use the keyboard shortcut C in order to create a new page. And let's give this page a title. So let's say this is, I'm gonna keep this as a draft. This is my draft page. And then we can either click in the body or we can use tab in order to tab to the body and start typing. Let's say, there we go, the space intentionally blank. Now, instead of publishing this, let's say we're not ready to publish it yet, but we're done for now. We don't wanna do any more editing right now. We just wanna save this and come back to it later. Well, the saving part is easy. Confluence does that in the background all the time. There is no save button. It's constantly saving in the background all the time. So all we need to do is to close out of this page. And then that is now a draft that we can come back to later. But how can we get back to it? It's not published, so it doesn't show up over here in our space. In order to get back to this, all we, can, all we need to do is to either come up to recent and come into drafts. And we may need to refresh the page since we just <laughs> did that. Let's come in here. There we go. So now we have my draft page that we can get back to, or we can go back to our home page and find the draft here as well. And then we just need to click on this. That'll take us right back to where we can start editing this and, and get it ready for publishing. Okay, so let's make some changes to this. 
let's say, okay, now this is my published page. And now we can go ahead and publish this because we're going to look at unpublished versions. Okay, so now that we've published this page, if we come in and edit this, let's say, okay, let's add in some text to the page. So now that this is a published page, if we close out of this, you can see we don't have that updated text that we've added because we didn't actually publish those changes, right? But if we come back and edit this, we can see that is still there. So that's the difference between a draft and an unpublished version. So basically the draft is we haven't published it at all. And then once we publish it, if we make changes to that, but we don't publish those changes, the published version of that page is still there. We just have some unpublished edits or some unpublished changes that have been made to the page. Now for this page, it's really simple to see what the changes are because we just made them. But depending on the complexity of the page, it can be hard to tell what is the uh, unpublished change. So we can just come into the three dots here and then come into view changes. And that will show us a preview of what has changed on this page. So this text here has been added to the page. One thing to keep in mind here, you'll notice that this is only showing us the body of the page. It's not showing us the title of the page. So if the title has, has changed but hasn't been published, then we're not going to see that in this change here. Uh, another place that we can go in order to uh, make our edits, it's helpful to see our edits, is if we come in here and go to preview, then that will show us a preview of what our page will look like. You'll notice it's including those unpublished changes, but we haven't actually published it yet. So it's not visible for anybody that has access to that, to that page, uh, but we can still see what it's going to look like once it is actually published. Then we can always come back in, go back to the editor to see that as well. And at any time when we're editing, here, if we're like, you know what, I I don't like any of these edits. I want to go back to the version that has been published. Well, we can come in here and revert to the last published version, get a confirmation. We can see, okay, yep, these are the changes. That's fine. I don't want those. I'm going to go ahead and revert the page back. And now this page, if we come in and edit this, we can see that change is no longer there because we've reverted it to the published version. Okay, so in this video, we learned about drafts for new pages and how to access them without publishing our pages. We also learned how to edit our page after publishing it and how to access those changes without ever publishing the page, those unpublished changes. And we wrapped up the video by learning how to get rid of any unpublished changes by reverting the page back to the last published version. Now, we looked at editing a page very briefly in this video, but let's move on to our next video where we can take a closer look at editing an existing page. See you there. In this video, we'll learn how to edit an existing page. So let's get started by hopping over to the page to edit, and we're going to use this one that we created in an earlier video. To edit this, there's a couple different ways we can do that. Either one, we could come up here to the top right and click on the pencil icon, or if we hover over that icon, we can see the keyboard shortcut to edit is simply E on the keyboard, E for edit. You can tap that, and that will take us into the page editor. Now, this is exactly the same page editor as what we saw when we created the page in the first place. Of course, how we edit this page is really going to depend on the end result that you want. The content you have and how you want to display it are obviously going to be different than the sample page here. But let me show you some of the more common things that you may come across. First thing I want to point out is that we can toggle this page to be full width or fixed width using this button right here. Really kind of depends on how we want our page to be laid out. And speaking of laying out our page, we can add in new column layout using 
this right here. And this is a great way to control how the information is displayed on the page. You can see right here, it's a two column layout by default. But if we click in here, we can adjust this to be, uh, you know, maybe we want three columns or we want a right sidebar, left sidebar, or maybe the three columns with sidebars on either side. Now, one of the cool things about Confluence is we can drag and drop content. How we drag and drop that content can vary depending on what that content is. So for example, this meeting, inf meeting overview here, this whole thing is its own panel, right? So we could adjust this, you know, maybe we want it to be a note, um, success warning, however we want this to be displayed. But this entire panel can move um, by itself or move all in one. So to do that, all we need to do is to select the entire panel. Once it's selected, we can just left click and drag that. So we we'll say we want that in our column layout. Now that's good. That's moving items is can be different depending on how that item is created. So this here, this is not its own panel. This is really just some text and an image. So if we wanted to move this, we would have to click on it and you know, uh, left click and drag to select it and then drag that over. But you can see it doesn't bring everything else with it because that's not really a panel. It's just the image and text that's been designed to look similar to a panel. And the same thing for the meeting minutes here in this template. This is all just text that we could left click and drag and then you know move this around if we wanted to. But I wanna show this table here because we can control how this table is laid out uh, quite a bit. And again, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. If you're used to tables, you know, you can resize it however you want. You can have, have that header column or if you want, uh, you know, the header row however you want this displayed. For this table itself, we could toggle this wider. How, depending on how our table is displayed, you'll notice, or the, the content within the table rather, you'll notice our overall page is still fixed. It's not full width, but just the table is larger. And sometimes depending on the data that we have in a table, we need that extra space. And of course, up here at the top, we have a pretty straightforward way of editing our text. So we can choose the heading that we want or normal text. Let's, let's come in here. I'm gonna add in some text here. So I'm just gonna, this is my sample text, just so we can see, okay, this is normal. Let's say we wanted this to be a heading. We can adjust that however we want to. Uh, of course, bold italicize, all these different formattings, pretty straightforward things. One of the key things I wanna point out here is all the way at the end, there is a lot of things that we can add, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of stuff that we can pull into our page to really customize it however we want. Now, earlier in this course, we learned about the term macro and we can add in a macro here. So let's say, I wanna add something in from Jira. So I'm gonna pull in this Jira macro. So once we insert this, now we can say, okay, what do we want to, what issues do we want to display? Okay, now if you're familiar with Jira, I'm not, I'm not gonna to go too far into Jira in this course, because it is outside the scope, but this filter here would be the exact same as creating a saved filter over in Jira. So let's say we want anything that's in the project, I happen to know I have a marketing project over there, so I have some issues in there. Let's insert that, and we can see all this information is being pulled into our Confluence page from our Jira installation, which is a really, really cool way of being able to work back and forth between Jira and Confluence. And once we're happy with it, of course, we can come in, publish the page, and see the difference that we have. So we have our, our JIRA issues, we've adjusted our table, and we've adjusted the layout as well up here. So what I'd really encourage you to do between videos here is to come in and just start 
playing with some of these macros and, and um, content tools that we have available inside of Confluence to see how you can use them in your organization to be more productive. And when you're ready, I'll see you in the next video where we'll learn how we can set up a new homepage for our space. In this video, we'll learn how to set a new page as our Confluence Spaces homepage. So as we learned earlier, each space in Confluence has a homepage. That's simply when we come up and we select the space, that's going to be the page that we go to by default. So we can see uh, right here, it's this page here. And it's always going to be listed as overview in the left side menu. Now, if we want to change this, let's say, you know what? We want this page that we were editing in our last video. Maybe we want this to be the home page for this space. All we need to do is to come into our space settings, change the space details, and then we can see the home page here. So let's edit our space details and let's change this to be, we can see as we start to type this, uh, Confluence realizes what the title of that page is. Hit save. And now if we come up to the space, now our homepage has changed for this space. So I'd really encourage you to take advantage of this. Use the homepage for these for each space as a way of be, helping your team be more productive. Whether that's pulling in Jira issues that they are they they need to see, whether that's um, helping give some tips and tricks for how they can navigate the space, whatever that may be. Using the homepage for the space is a great way of helping your team be more productive. Now in our next video, we're gonna come in and we're gonna just get an overview of some of these other space settings that we have available to us. In this video, we'll get an overview of the space settings section. Now I do wanna point out before we even begin, you have to be an administrator of the space in order to see the space settings section in the sidebar. But if you are, you can hop in there. Now, Atlassian has made quite a bit of changes to how this is laid out. You can see this little notification down here. They've changed how the space settings are organized. So if this looks completely different on your end, that just means you're running a slightly older version of Confluence. The settings themselves are the same, just how they're organized has been changed. So let's start at the top left here with manage space. I'm going to click on space details. In here, we can do things like add a logo, change the logo for this space. You can see over here in the sidebar, uh, change the name of the space, the key, the home page, uh, like we looked at in an earlier video. All of those are things that we can do if we edit the space details here. I also want to point out how this is structured, right? So we are in the manage space section, and then there's these different tabs, right? So if we hop back real quick to the space settings, you can see space settings, edit sidebar, archive, delete, export. Those are the same as these tabs here. So that's how these space settings are organized. And then if we edit the sidebar, we can come in and say, you know what, maybe I don't want this overview. It's kind of redundant. It's going to take you to the homepage. Uh, when you click on the space anyway, we don't need this. We can turn that off. Same with the blog. If you're not using the blog, that can just take up space in the sidebar. If you're not using it, you can turn that off in this space as well. Uh, we will look at archiving, deleting, exporting later on in this course. Uh, but just know that those options are there. I also want to point out over here on the sidebar, we have the other sections. So again, we have space permissions, manage pages. If we go back to the overall space settings, you can see manage space, space permissions, manage pages, 
So that is how this is organized here. Just a, a quick way to get to all these things. Uh, the space permissions we looked at previously when we we're looking at a personal space, and we'll look at permissions in more depth later on in this course as well. Just know that these are in here. The ability to manage pages so we can reorder the pages. Uh, one thing I do want to point out in this video are hidden pages. So hidden pages, we actually created a hidden page in an earlier video, when we changed the space homepage, we turned the website documentation home, which used to be the homepage for this space, we turned that into a hidden space or a hidden page rather. A hidden page just means that there's no link to it and it, there's no parent page, right? So it's not listed over here in the sidebar and there's no link to it from any other page inside of Confluence. So it's not that the page doesn't exist. You can still get to it. We can still click on this. We can still go and, and see this page. But unless we have this, the URL to this page, it's going to be really hard to get to it because there's no link to it inside of Confluence. So that's something to keep in mind as you're managing your space. You may want to come in here and look and see if you have any hidden pages that need to have links added somewhere. And then on the other side of that, we have undefined pages. So an undefined page, you can see here, is a page that has been linked to from, in conf from inside of Confluence, but it doesn't exist yet. You may have seen this in other wiki tools, like maybe you've been browsing on Wikipedia and you see that there's a link to a page and you click on that and it wants you to create that page. Well, you can do that same sort of thing inside of Confluence. So as you're creating a page, you can say, you know what, I need... There needs to be a page on whatever this topic is. Just don't have the time to create it right now. So we'll create that undefined page. Let me actually, you know, let me actually create one real quick just so we can see what that looks like. We can see how that's different. There's a unique way that you can create undefined pages inside of Confluence. And I believe they're going to be adding it up here. Uh, but as of this recording, that's not up there yet. So here is the code for how you can do that. So let's say um, this is an page. So what we would do is do an open brackets and then give the page a title. Something like that. Close bracket. And then we're going to use parentheses to give it a link. Right? So inside parentheses, we could give it a link to whatever we want, or if we just do a close parentheses right here, what we're doing is telling Confluence, let me hit space, it's gonna create an undefined page. So when we click on this, you can see the link down here at the bottom, it's going to create that new page and we can start to do that. So let's see, this page has an undefined page. I just want to publish this so that we can go back into our space settings and see that an undefined link or an undefined page lists, right? So this is the page where that undefined page lives, and this is the name of it. So it hasn't been created yet, but it's ready to be created inside of Confluence. And then we have attachments. All the attachments in the space, we'll look at managing those later on. We have trash, so when we delete a page, it's going to go into trash here. When you delete a space, there's no trash, but when you delete a, a page, it'll go into trash here, and we can pull it out if we want to, um, as well as page restrictions, and we'll look at that later on in this course as well. Next, we have the look and feel. So you can install new themes uh, by default. I don't have any extra add-ons or anything inside of this Confluence installation. So there's no themes installed here, but you can change the theme if you want to. You can work with templates. So we, we briefly covered templates. You can uh, We looked at that when we were creating page, how we came in here and disabled a lot of these templates. Uh, and we'll look at creating templates later on in this course as well. And then we have the page layout. So this is kind of deceptive in, in the term, terminology, I think. Uh, really what this is, is this can insert a header or a footer across every single page on that space. So the biggest reason I've seen this used in the companies that I've consulted for is if there's some sort of a, an announcement across the organization, across everybody that has access to that space, you can add that announcement in here. Uh, 
so that it'll be displayed across every single page. Everybody's going to see it. And then, of course, uh, we have the ability to export. We will look at exporting later on in this course as well. And then last but certainly not least, we have our integrations. So we can see right here, uh, these links are set up by the system administrator, which is the overall administrator, not necessarily the administrator of a single space. But what this is talking about with application links would be a lot of these applications up here. If So right now you can see I have a JIRA license as well as Confluence. So I could come in and link this Confluence space to a project inside of JIRA. And really what that does is it adds a link on the sidebar inside of JIRA that gives people in JIRA a quick way to jump not only to Confluence, but to this space directly from a project inside of JIRA. Uh, and then we have any RSS feed. So if we are using blogs, things like that, this is just where you can come in and get that RSS feed link, add that to whatever sort of RSS client that you're using. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, then you're probably not using it and not really, not really needed. But those are in there just as an FYI. And then we have Slack notifications. So this is something, again, I'm not really going to be going into third-party apps, but if your team is using Slack, then Atlassian has teamed up with Slack and they've got some you can get notifications of things when something happens inside of Confluence, say somebody creates a new page or comments on a page inside of this space, then you can hook that into a channel inside of Slack and start to uh, get notifications directly there. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. Now, to get the course transcript and follow along with this video, click right over there and click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.